This is from one of my favourite books called Changing Stories. It's How Crab Got Its Back. In a village, there once lived two sisters who were as different from each other as chalk from cheese. Esmeralda, the younger sister, was plain as plain could be. She was kind to everyone and worked from morning till night, scrubbing and cleaning their little house, so that it was neat as a pin. Yolanda, the elder sister, was the most beautiful girl in the village, but she was proud and haughty, and never a finger would she lift to help her sister. One day Esmeralda went to the river to fill her goblet and she saw, sitting at the water's edge, a strange old woman. Around the woman's waist was wrapped a towel, but her back was bare and she was trying to scoop up water in her thin, wasted hands to wash her back. When she saw Esmeralda, she began to sing in a voice that was high and shrill. Scratch my back, daughter, wash it well with water. Esmeralda saw the old woman's back was lined and very sore, and she felt very sorry for her. Although the old woman's back felt as hard as board, Esmeralda scratched it and washed it until her nails were broken. But as soon as she stopped, the old woman began to complain and sing, Scratch my back, daughter, wash it well with water. And although the old woman's back felt as sharp as broken bottles, Esmeralda scratched it and washed it until her hands were bleeding. Then the old woman said in a voice as gentle as a pigeon's cooing, Child, you have been patient and kind to a miserable old woman, and I should like to give you something in return. What do you wish for most? Esmeralda felt ashamed to ask anything of one who seemed so much in need, so she replied, Just your blessing, mother. Well, said the old woman, you may have that and more. Look in the water, Esmeralda, and you shall see what you will be. Imagine Esmeralda's surprise when she looked in the water and saw not her plain face, but the most beautiful, the kindest face she had ever seen. She raised her head to thank the old woman, but the old woman had vanished. At first, Yolanda could not believe that this beautiful girl was indeed Esmeralda, whom she had scorned and ill-treated all her life. She was green with envy, and without waiting to hear the whole story, she rushed down to the river, for she thought, stupid Esmeralda, where does she think a pretty face will get her? I shall ask for great wealth then I shan't have to share that pig's den with her. As Yolanda went down to the river, she saw, sitting at the water's edge, the ugliest old woman she had ever set eyes on. Her hands and feet were shriveled until they looked like claws, and her bare back was crossed by so many lines that it looked as though it were cracked all over. When the old woman saw Yolanda, she began to sing in a voice that was high and shrill. Scratch my back, daughter, wash it well with water. But Yolanda was in a fever of impatience to find the source of her sister's good fortune, nor did she know that she had found it, for she only had one wicked thought in her head. Out of my way, you ugly creature, she said. Do you expect me to wallow in the mud with you? Scratch your back with those claws of yours. And she pushed the old woman to one side. Insolent girl, said the woman. As you see me, so shall you be. At that moment, Yolanda became an ugly creature. Her limbs shriveled up and turned into her claws, and her back became hard and cracked all over. She cannot now bear to be seen, for she remembers that once she was beautiful, so she wallows in the mud and hides away under rocks and cliffs. And when sand and mud fill the cracks in her back and it itches, she rushes down to the river to wash it off, for no one will scratch her back. The Long Road Home by Maggie Pearson. He'd missed the last bus 
and it was a long walk home. But he'd had a good evening and there was a full moon to light him along the country lanes. He hadn't gone but half a mile out of town when he heard footsteps behind him. He stopped, turned and saw the owner of the footsteps had stopped too. One lad called out to him, come on then, let's walk along together. The stranger didn't answer. He didn't move till our lad set off again and heard footsteps following along behind him. So he stopped again and so did the other fellow. Our lad called out to him, do I know you? No answer. On they went again, our lad quickening his footsteps now, but each time he glanced back the other fellow was just a little bit closer. The first car that came along, he'd flag it down and beg for a lift. But there were no cars on the road that night. Just himself and the silent stranger. He was running and reached the crossroads. The other fellow was running too. Any minute now, he expected to feel hot breath on the back of his neck. And then what? Then he heard the clippity-clop of hooves and a pony and trap came trotting round the corner. Stop, please stop. The driver stopped. Can you give me a lift, please? The driver nodded and our lad climbed up beside him. Off they went again. No sound now, but the clippity-clop of the pony's hooves. Our lad turned once to look behind and saw only the empty road stretching out in the moonlight. Not a shadow moved in the open fields on either side. He leaned back and smiled to himself. Here was a tale to tell on winter evenings with the lights turned low. Do you believe in ghosts? he asked. The driver turned his head towards him and in the cold moonlight he saw that the driver had no face. <sighs> and the pony trotted on, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, into the dark. Pig by Maggie Pearson. He was Jack the Lad in his brand new company car. Not to 60 in however many seconds. Stereo turned up full volume. Oh yes, he was somebody now. He thought, tossing his empty coat can out of the window. Pig, yelled the driver, coming the other way, having to pull hard over to avoid him. Pig yourself, he yelled back, leaning out of the window as he turned the corner. Too late, he saw the pig standing in the middle of the road. This is a story that is called Cannibals and it's from Kevin Crossley Holland and it's kind of funny story. Cannibals. Lena's old grandparents were upset when they were separated from their granddaughter by the war. Each week they sent her and her young family food parcels from America. And even after Grandma died, Grandpa went on sending parcels regular as clockwork. Spam, powdered eggs, sugar, chocolate, and even a pair of outside shoes for Lena's outside husband. Lena couldn't have been more grateful. My two boys are growing so fast, she thought. However, Mata gave them, it's never enough. When one parcel arrived, it contained a big tin of pale grey powder without a label on it, and Lena wasn't quite sure what it was. I lied it to the broth, she told her husband. Good idea, he said. It will give it somebody. Within a couple of weeks, Lena's young family had finished off the whole tin, and a few days later, she received a letter from her old grandfather. Dearest Lena, he began, did I tell you the unlabeled tin contains grandma's ashes? Her last wish 
was to go home. Please, can you sprinkle them around the garden? She left so much. So the story is called Love and Time. Once upon a time, in an island, there lived all the feelings and emotions, happiness, sadness, knowledge, and all of others, including love. One day it was announced to them that the island would sink. So all constructed boats and left, except for love. Love wanted to hold out until the last possible moment. When the island had almost sunk, Love decided to ask for help. Richness was passing by Love in a boat. Love said, Richness, can you take me with you? Richness answered, Sorry Love, I can't. There is a lot of gold and silver in my boat, and so there is no place here for you. Love next asked Vanity, who was also sailing by. Vanity was also ready with the same answer. I can't help you, Love. You're all wet and might damage my boat, Vanity answered. Sadness was close by, so Love asked, Sadness, take me along with you. Oh, Love, I'm so sad that I need to be by myself, Sadness said in a sullen voice. Happiness passed by Love too, but she was so preoccupied with her happiness that she did not even hear when Love called her. Suddenly there was a voice, Come, Love. I will take you. It was an elder. An overjoyed love jumped up into the boat and in the process forgot to ask where they were going. When they arrived at dry land, the elder went in her own way. Realising how much was owed to the elder, love asked Knowledge, who was another elder, who helped me? It was time, Knowledge answered. Time, thought love. Then, as if reading the face of love, knowledge smiled and answered, because only time is capable of understanding how valuable love is. The Princess and the Wee by Hilda Parkin. Far away and long, long ago, the kingdom of Splods in a terrible mess. It's lost Lucinda, its princess. The reason for this nasty hitch, she was stolen aged two by a wicked witch. Thirteen years later, the heralds shout, we need a princess, we're all out. And every lass in the land says, E, diamonds and palaces, sounds like me. So into Splod stream 2,000 lasses in teams and ranks and squads and masses. And they stand and scream at the palace gate, I were nicked by a witch, oh cruel fate. The king calls his guards and says, Hey boys, I can't be having with all this noise. Either chase them away with a knotty stick, or find me the real princess right quick. As it happened, Lucinda were there in the throng, eating an ice cream, but eating it wrong. So it dribbled and made a right mess of her skirt. And she said, someone will wash it off, a splash won't hurt. Some princesses are daft, and others are dafter, but all of them are used to being cleaned up after. The trumpet sounded, the heralds roared. The king stuck his head out, looking bored. He said, we'll find out who plays the princess best by letting you all take a tiny wee test. At supper that night, every mother's daughter was compelled to drink four jugs of water, then given a lovely room to be in, but without a sign of a lad to wee in. In the middle of the night, they were half insane, running in the corridors, roaring with pain. It's a lovely bed and I mustn't spoil it, cried the would-be princess. Where's the toilet? In all this racket though, one girl lay still. Lucinda, the princess, had drunk her fill. Now she lay in a pool of wee, thinking, someone will come and clean up after me. Next morning the king cried, Lucinda, my pippin. That's me, said Lucinda, standing there dripping. Hey up, I seem to be soaking wet. Well, someone will come and dry me, I bet. The real thing, cried the king through his happy tears, and they both lived happily ever after for years and years. The mirror. They did have other things. They had sky dragons. They had pale porcelain bowls that sang with piping blue voices. They had clicking ivy characters and bearded calligraphers. 
But in that far off village and far off time, they had no mirrors, no mirrors at all. Most people had never even heard of them. The young farmer had heard about mirrors though, and he wanted to give one to his young bride so she could see what others saw, the crescent of her eyebrows, the yellow, black and misty eyes. So the young man sold one of his three cows and he walked for three days to the great city and you must used almost all his money to buy a mirror. Moonrise and sunset. In giving birth to her first child, a daughter, the young wife died. Then her husband could not bear even to look at the mirror. He hid it away at the bottom of an old trunk. As she grew up, his daughter sometimes asked people about her mother. You are beautiful in the same strange way she was, they told her. The same eyebrows and the eyes here. The little crease in the corner of your mouth. 15, 16. One day, when the girl was 17, she started rooting around in the attic, looking for something different to wear. But when she found at the bottom of the old trunk was her mother's mirror. The girl looked into it. She looked, and then she ran down to her father. I found her, she cried. She's still here. You should have told me, look. But her father did not look, and his love and pain were so great that at first he could not cry. Sunset and moonrise. And the man held his shining daughter in his arms. The Scorpion and the Frog by Maggie Pearson. A frog sat sunning himself on a lily pad in the cool morning mist. Later the sun would grow too hot, he'd crawl away and find himself a patch of shade. Before the moment, life was good. Life was just perfect. Mr. Frog, Mr. Frog, excuse me, Mr. Frog. Frog turned his head to see a scorpion scuttling backwards and forwards on the river bank. What is it, he asked. Mr. Frog, I hardly like to ask, but I wonder if you would be so kind as to carry me to the other side of the river. No way, said the frog. He'd be warned about scorpions when he was scarcely more than a tadpole. Scorpions had a sting that would kill you stone dead in under a minute. Please, Mr. Frog, my sister's sick and there's no one to look after her seven children. No, said Frog, just a bit miffled, miffed at having his fine morning spoiled. Please, begged the scorpion. For the sake of my sister's soon to be motherless children, are you afraid I might sting you? That would be stupid, wouldn't it? You'd sink and I'd be drowned. It was a nice morning, after all. It gave you the sort of good feeling you wanted to share. So Frog hopped over to the bank and let the scorpion climb onto his back. He hadn't swum but halfway across the river when he felt the deadly sting of the scorpion's tail. What did you do that for? He cried. Now we're both done for. I'm a scorpion, shrugged the scorpion. It's what scorpions do. My bag is brown, the colour of the earth. There are rocks in my bag, hard and rough. There's a road in my bag. It is the road of choices. There are robbers in my bag who hide among the rocks. And there are travellers in my bag. Each travel alone. And there are coins in my bag. Coins for caring. Our story takes place on a brown cloth, the colour of the earth. Across the cloth runs a road. This is the road of choices. Everyone who walks along this road makes a choice. There are rocks on the road. And there are robbers who hide amongst the rocks. They are waiting to attack. The first traveller walks down the road. When he reaches the rocks, the robbers attack and leave him injured on the road. A second traveller walks down the road. He sees the injured man and makes a choice. He crosses over and walks on. He does not help. A third traveller walks down the road. He sees the injured man 
and makes a choice. He too crosses over and walks on. He does not help. Finally, a fourth man walks along the road. He is an enemy. He sees the injured man and makes a choice. He stops to help. He carries the injured man to the town and pays for his care. Each person made a choice. Their choices show us what sort of people they are. We too make choices as we walk through life. Our choices show what sort of people we are. The Timely Warning by Louise Cooper. The coach rumbled along the dark road. It was pouring and the rain danced and glittered in the headlights, making it hard to see anything through the windscreen. Bert, the driver, was concentrating grimly. Beside him, Maggie, the tour guide, felt nervous. Their party had been on an outing, but there was a diversion on the main road they had had to come back on these unfamiliar country lanes. Bert was a very good driver, but in weather like this, who knew what hazards there might be? The rain was heavier than ever now. Reminds me of one time when I went out with my dad, said Bert. His father had been a coach driver too. And when Bert was a boy, he had sometimes travelled with him. Filthy night it was. We were lucky to get home. Maggie shivered. She didn't want to hear stories like that. She glimpsed lights up ahead. There's something coming, she pointed. Is the road wide enough for us to pass? Should be, said Bert. The headlights were drawing closer and suddenly they started to flash. Uh oh, said Bert. What's this trouble? He slowed right down. Through the rain, Maggie saw another coach coming towards them an old-fashioned one with the name Paul's Tours painted across the front. It stopped and so did Bert with a jolt. Careful, said Maggie. Bert didn't reply. He was staring at the other coach. The driver had wound his window down and was shouting something. He wants to talk to you, said Maggie. Bert didn't move. The other driver was shouting again and with a sigh Maggie leaned past Bert and opened the window. There's been a landslip, the other driver called. Just round the next bend, the road's collapsed and there's no warning. An ice cold feeling washed over Maggie's skin. If it hadn't been for the warning, they would have driven straight into the disaster. She called back, thank you. And with a roar, the other coach moved off again. Bert, did you hear that? She gasped. Yes, said Bert in a strange voice. I heard. We'd better back up and turn round. Bert swallowed. That was my dad's old coach, he said. Good heavens, still running after all these years. You don't understand, said Bert. It wasn't just dad's coach. It was dad driving. He paused and he's been dead for 20 years. This is The Hairy Woman by Kevin Crossley Holland. This actually happened to someone I know. I know her well, my own daughter. That's why I'm sure it's true. Coral, that's her. She was down at the supermarket for the weekly shop, Friday, five-ish. It's always crowded, she says, but she works until half past four, so she can't go before that. Coral's in the car park. She just loaded all the plastic bags into the boot when a big woman lurched up to her. You know, a bit of a lump, specks, powerful eyebrows. She was wearing a long, dark skirt. Give me a lift, love, the woman asked. Just down to the bus stop. I've only got this one bag, but it's that heavy. Hop in, said my daughter. You can put your bag on the back seat. But halfway down the road, Coral saw how big and blunt and rough the woman's fingertips were. And then she looked down below. Below her dark skirt and above her boots, her passenger had hairy, muscular legs and a shining knife was taped to the right one. Oh, 
My coach didn't half think fast. She braked, she braked hard. Hang on, she exclaimed. There's my dad, that policeman. A passenger didn't hang around. He swung the door open and scrambled out. He scrambled out so fast, he forgot his canvas bag. You know what was in it? A hammer, yes. And a wicked axe. And a sharp toothed saw. This is a story from Changing Stories, a collection of folk and fairy tales, often with a twist. This one is called Red Riding Hood. One afternoon, a big wolf waited in a dark forest for a little girl to come along, carrying a basket of food to her grandmother. Finally, a little girl did come along and she was carrying a basket of food. Are you carrying that basket of food to your grandmother? growled the wolf. The little girl says yes she was. So the wolf asked her where her grandmother lived and the little girl told him and he disappeared into the wood. When the little girl opened the door of her grandmother's house she saw there was somebody in bed with a nightcap on. She had approached no nearer than 25 feet from the bed when she saw it was not her grandmother, but the wolf. For even in a nightcap, a wolf doesn't look any more like your grandmother than Mickey Mouse looks like the Prime Minister. So, the little girl took an automatic out of her basket and shot the wolf dead. Moral, it is not so easy to fool little girls nowadays as it used to be. I'm reading a story called A Wahoo by Maggie Pearson. An old woman sat by the fire alone and she was sick of it. Night after night her old man went todding off to the pub and never came back till past closing time. I'll teach him, she muttered. I'll fright him so he'll never go out after dark again. She took an old sheet and she cut two eye holes in it. Then she flung it over her head and hurried down to the porch and waited for the old man to come wandering by on his own. Out she popped, wearing that old sheet, waving her arms about and crying, Woohoo! Woohoo! The old man stopped. He turned to look at her. He smiled. Is it you again, you old ghost? He said. And tonight you brought a friend along to keep you company. That's nice. Behind her, the old woman heard a voice whispering, Woohoo! Woohoo! The Two Husbands by Maggie Pearson. Men, said Molly. They are so stupid. Tell me about it, said Polly. My husband will believe anything I tell him. He can't be stupider than mine. Oh no. When Molly got home to her husband, happy birthday, she said. Is it my birthday? He opened the box she gave him. It looked empty. Don't you like the new suit I bought you, she said. Let me help you on with it. There you go, light as a feather, isn't it? Hmm, very nice, very smart, says he, strutting around the house in his underwear. Meanwhile, Polly goes home, takes one look at her husband and says, you should be in bed. Should I? he says. You're ill, maybe even dying. Next morning, just as I feared, you're dead, she says. Am I? says he. Oh, I suppose you're right. And lies down in the coffin, good as gold, while she phones up all their friends and relations to come to the wake. First outing for Molly's husband, fine. New invisible suit. All the friends and relatives, well, they know it's supposed to be a sad occasion. But walking around in his underwear, <laughs> you've got to laugh, haven't you? And laugh they did, till their sides were aching and the tears were rolling down their cheeks. Till a voice came from the coffin. I'd be laughing too if I wasn't dead.